Okay, so here's what I'm going to cover today. So why pursue patent protection? <clears throat> Some background and definitions that will help you follow what I'm saying better, hopefully. Um, patentability requirements, so what makes an invention patentable? What are the elements of a patent application and how can you as a researcher with your scientific and research expertise contribute to that in the most effective way? I think that's really critical. Um, that's the place where if I can transfer some knowledge to you, that's the place where I really like to do it. Um, and then what is the process for um, preparing and pursuing a patent application? And then some best practices that I would suggest for you as uh, academic or, or um, public sector funded researchers. So why are patents necessary? So probably you all know, you know, I'm sure many of you are working on therapies or um, maybe diagnostics, um, and I'm sure that you're all aware that um, doing the clinical development of these type of innovations and bringing them to patients is really expensive. Uh, not only is it, ex is it expensive, you know, 40 to 100 million dollars starting from preclinical work all the way uh, to um, registration at the FDA, but it's extremely risky too. So this figure, which I can't really see on my computer without my glasses, shows you the percentages, the per you know, the probability of success. So, uh, and it compares um, new uh, molecular entities, so brand new compounds that have never been approved for therapeutic use before, to biologics, and then um, new uh, applications or new formulations of compounds that have already been approved for clinical use already. And you can see that the success rate going from phase one all the way to approval is extremely low. So for brand new compounds, it's only 6.2%. So not only is it a lot of money, but the chance that all that money is going to be lost is extremely high. And that's why it doesn't make sense for us to pay for that kind of work with you know, most of the time it doesn't make sense for us to pay for that kind of work with public sector money. And that's why people are hesitant to invest their funds in this kind of work. And that's why patents were um, created, the patent policy was implemented in the first place. Um, so this gives you kind of like what I see as the key um, benefits of, pharma of pharmaceutical patents and the reason why we have patent policy. So. They ensure that the innovator, if they're successful, is going to have market exclusivity in return for full disclosure of the invention. And we'll talk more about really what that means in terms of a patent application. And so with that, they can justify um, you know, why they would risk those funds in, within that kind of work. Otherwise, you know, they're going to invest it in something maybe that has that is less expensive or where the risk of uh, failure is lower you know developing software or whatever so we always have to remember that the private sector funds from pri pri uh, public or private companies um, that go into these kinds of projects they could go elsewhere if that investment dis if the investment elsewhere looked more attractive um, and then so as a result of that market exclusivity, the people who benefit from it, society and patients, they're going to pay a premium for a limited period of time. For, you know, a patent uh, uh, term is 20 years. They don't pay that premium for 20 years. They pay that premium pr typically for six to seven years. And that's because usually, as some of you know, when you file a patent application on, for example, a new compound with a therapeutic use, you do it you know, in the, before you even start preclinical work. And that whole, uh, the time span from pr the preclinical all the way to phase three is maybe five or six years. So you don't actually have 20 years of patent exclusivity. Typically, it's around six or seven years. Um, so I think I made the last point, no? Okay, so because of this, because of the way patent policy is designed, patents are, you know, especially from your point of view. In some industries, yes, you might use patents for defensive uses or other reasons, but I think for you, when you think about patenting, patenting you shouldn't be patenting things that are not commercializable. So it's really critical 
when you're in your research, if you have results, if you think that you want to patent something, you have to really ask yourself, is this commercializable? Is it feasible to commercialize this? Is there, would there be a commercial interest for this thing? Um, so that's really, that's critical. Um, okay, and patents don't act, especially patents for diagnostic uh, drugs, therapies, um, they don't act in isolation. So in the in the U.S., in Europe, and in, in Canada, we have what regulation regulators provide what's called market exclusivity. When you uh, do that clinical work and you bring that clinical data to the regulator and you get your innovation approved, depending on the type of innovation, the regulator is going to give you a certain period of time during which those clinical data cannot be used by a generic company. Um, to uh, get approval of a generic product. So that, that kind of protection is even stronger than patent protection because it can't be um, challenged in court. And it, the range of times uh, range, you know, from um, as long as, you know, seven to ten years for a drug that uh, targets a rare disease to um, maybe three years for a new formulation or something like that. And that is a, you know, a particular kind of lever that was implemented in ninth, starting in 1984 in the U.S. to try to promote investment in some areas that were being neglected. Um, one, because the commercial um, opportunity wasn't as strong as other opportunities, and also because it was difficult to get um, intellectual property protection in those areas. So, um, you know, maybe if you're developing a therapy for a rare disease, it's possible that maybe you don't even need patent protection because this market exclusivity is about the length of time that you would normally have patent protection for a new product anyway. So just to say that it's not um, the only kind of uh, market protection that you can have. I just thought for people who um, were you know, more unfamiliar with the process that this was kind of a cute picture that sort of gives you an overview of um, the main steps in uh, filing and pursuing a patent application and some of the key um, concepts. Okay, so before we get into uh, some of the more detailed stuff, I just wanted to go over some definitions. So uh, when you write a patent application, definitions are very important. You need to be crystal clear on uh, what you're talking about. So I'm going to kind of adopt that practice here in my presentation. So you may have heard people talking about a priority date. A priority date is the date at which you first disclosed your invention. And that's an important date because that is the date at which your, the patentability of your invention will be assessed by um, the examiners that look at it in different countries. Um, a patent publication date, that's when a, when a patent application is published. And, that, and the first patent application in a family will publish 18 months after the priority date. So you're going to file, you would, in most cases, you're filing patent applications in different countries. They may all publish at different times, but the first application that you file is going to publish 18 months after the priority date. And that's the point at which it becomes um, prior art for other people, including, um, you know, other collaborators, people that you work with. So it can be an important date for you to take, keep in mind. Um, Okay, so prior art. Prior art refers to um, any information that's uh, related to an invention that's available to the public before your priority date. Um, okay, so we're going to talk about embodiments of an invention. So often when you file a patent application, you know, you're going to have uh, an inventive concept. Let's say uh, you develop a cell therapy for treating um, solid tumors. Okay, so you file an application that says uh, cell therapy X for treating solid tumors. Embodiments of that invention would be, um, you know, colon cancer, kidney cancer, um, all the different, each, unless you have, unless you can get the claim to, if you could get the claim to treating cancer with your uh, cell therapy, which is highly unlikely because it's impossible to credibly show that any one therapy could treat all cancers, 
each of those claims to different um, cancers have to be pursued independently and each one is considered you know an embodiment of that broader idea um, patent disclosure so patent disclosure it refers to the description of the invention and all of its different embodiments that you're going to um, that would be in a patent application we also it's also referred to in some cases as a specification um, patent claims are really uh, the key thing to understand if you want to understand IP and be effective in your contributions to the process a patent claim is you know a sentence that captures um, one embodiment of your invention in a precise and clear way as clear and precise as possible and then everything else in the patent application stems from that and builds around the patent claims and it's not impossible for researchers like yourselves to understand patent claims and you really should you know do do a little reading look at patent applications in your domain and and ask questions of your tech transfer office understand how how they work um, it's not really not a black box and it's really critical um, to have a good understanding of that if you want to be um, you know really play an effective role in filing and pursuing patent applications that can stem from your research um, okay so I'm really going to focus on on uh, when I'm talking I'm going to be more focused on US law and the reason is because you know I've worked in this area for 23 years and we've all, our first priority has always been um, filing in the US and the reason is that that's the most important market for us even as Canadians oh sure Sorry, a hard time hearing you. oh there you go. that's the most impar important market for us uh, uh, and also in the US they've kind of in terms of intellectual property practice and intellectual property law and tech transfer they've really um, been the leaders so and and most of what I'm going to talk about although it's very US centric applies in, in Canada as well. There are a few minor subtle differences, but for most of the stuff I'm going to talk about today, it's really pretty much the same. Um, so not all inventions and innovations are um, patent eligible. So they have to meet um, certain criteria. So, and I've put them um, in the order that if I were evaluating um, an invention that I would think about them in this order and it's important the order that you think about them in so the first one is patentable subject matter the second one is that it needs to be unique and novel which basically boils down to that it's not disclosed anywhere publicly um, non-obvious inventive we're gonna get into that a little bit uh, you need it needs to be useful you need to have a specific uh, utility for your invention. You can't just claim a new compound and not give some credible evidence as to why that compound would be useful. Um, and you need very critical, you need an enabling um, disclosure. You need to teach, you know, and that has to do with this patent bargain, you need to teach people how to practice the invention. Um, okay, so this is from um, U.S. law. So um, whoever invents or discovers a u new and useful process, machine, manufacture, composition of matter, or an improvement um, can obtain a patent. So that gives you kind of a sense of some of the kinds of things that are patentable. This is what's in on the books, but in practice, our concept of this is actually much more complex and broad and that comes from um, court decisions you know you know over since the night the 30s which have refined these ideas and and um, established how this gets implemented into practice okay um, so some of the things that aren't patentable and I don't know you may have heard about some of the litigation in the past five years which was pretty um, prominent myriad and um, Prometheus so there and as our technologies have evolved and we've moved toward um, biologics and personalized medicine and oligonucleotides how we apply this has had to be refined and there's been quite a bit of litigation that's uh, in the US that's refined this and in Canada it's by the patent office here it's pretty much been 
adopted also in you know they've kind of adopted their way of working to sort of move in a similar direction so law, laws of nature abstract ideas natural phenomenon are not patentable so like a naturally occurring antibody by itself is not patentable a naturally occurring oligonucleotide by itself is not patentable um, and then when it comes to software if your software uh, is just a, a, a simple, easy expression of an abstract idea or let's say some kind of mathematical um, formula, that's not patentable. Um, methods or compositions, though, that employ or apply a natural, uh, a law of nature or a natural phenomenon, as long as they're inventive, as long as they meet the other criteria, those are patentable. So man-made compounds, methods of treatment, formulations. If you discover a gene and that informs a new way of treating people, a way of treating people uh, that wasn't used before, then even though your claim might uh, recite a naturally occurring thing, the oligonucleotide that you're detecting, it's still um, patentable. Okay, so just to get into um, uh, novel, novelty a little bit. Okay, so in practice, basically, if all of, you know, and this again comes back to the claim. So your claim is going to recite different features of your invention. If all of those features are described in one document, in one publication elsewhere, then your invention is not um, novel. Um, or in an unpub unpublished patent application. So if somebody filed on exactly the same thing um, before you did, even though it's not published, that can uh, be, uh, you know, that can, uh, you know, it can make your invention not novel, even though you didn't know about it. Um, and important for you to know in Canada, if let's say you do publish something, and then after you realize, oh, crap, there's an invention in there that I wanted to pursue. In Canada and in the US and in some other countries but not in Europe, there's what's called a one-year grace period. So if it's the same inventor that made inventors that made the disclosure, you have you still have one year um, to file uh, your patent application. But in that case it's very critical that all of the inventors are exactly the same. Um, what else did I want to say here? Any questions about novelty? Mm. Yeah, there are some new guidelines from patent offices about things online that constitute prior art. Basically, if, if it's publicly available, if someone could find it, um, then it's considered prior art. I mean, even the disclosure to someone else without a confidentiality agreement is public disclosure, but I have never seen anything like that cited by an examiner. But it's not to say that it can't happen. Yeah? What about a fraudulent disclosure? Fraudulent disclosure? Well, I think even if it's like fraudulent or something that the inventor, if it's your information and you didn't consent to being it, to being published, I don't, that's not a, if the examiner happens to find it, I don't think that's going to help you. It's still, well, you would have the one year grace period as long as it was within that one year grace period. I have never seen that. I mean, I wouldn't, I wouldn't worry about that, but I think in the future things like this could become more of an issue, so yeah. Yeah. Um, okay, well, if it's an improvement, typically you're probably going to like move into the realm of obviousness. But one thing is that for sure what you as scientists consider novel or n non-obvious 
uh, you, you know, it's not the same as what is novel or non-obvious from this kind of legal concept perspective. So I think if you make uh, a concrete improvement to something, like especially if it's a uh, a physical thing, like let's say with a drug. A drug is a very easy example. You know, I've seen um, people who filed. You know, we I worked on a drug once that had. Um, it had like a long carbon chain in the middle and then it had two moieties on each end. And that long chain was meant to be hydrophobic and we knew that the hydrophobicity of that long middle part was important to how this drug functioned. Another group, and we had a, like a broad claims around that, another group, but we had never claimed any variations on this long chain except for the size of it. And another group came <coughs> along and they put some methyl groups like here and there on that chain to make it a little more hydrophobic and they showed that those compounds actually worked better than the compounds we had and they were able to patent those compounds. <coughs> so when it comes to compounds especially like you know there's anything is possible and this again gets into obviousness and we're gonna I'll talk about that a bit more but it's a great example anything is possible and if you don't know for sure or with a high level of confidence that something is gonna benefit your invention in a certain way, if you have to do research to figure it out, then typically it's not obvious. So I would really in your mind, you know, what you think as, of as obvious or not novel, novel as a researcher, it's different from this uh, legal concept. Um, so non-obvious, so your invention has to be non-obvious, it needs to be inventive okay that's something that's also going to be established as of the priority date and when you have an obviousness rejection when you have an obviousness issue during the examination it's going to come up as a combination of uh, references that include all of the different elements that you um, that you want that you have in your claim to define your invention um, and it really the interpretation of that depends on what's taught in the prior art it depends obviously on the difference between what you're, the invention that you're trying to protect and um, what's described in the prior art. And it also depends on what's called, what's called we call person skilled in the art. How, what is the level of skill of a person skilled in the art and what would they expect is possible or not possible. Um, so this is really the most common basis for rejection that you'll, you'll see in, uh, when you're pursuing a patent. Um, and it can be really challenging to overcome this. And in, the, in Europe, the same concept is, a similar concept is uh, referred to as inventiveness or inventive contribution. Okay, uh, so it's, uh, you know, I don't wanna spend too much time on this, but in, in practice it's de defined based on case law more on what it's not than on than what it is and here you can see some examples of how in based on case law what it's been you know how it's been defined um, what things are obvious uh, I don't have a lot of time so I'm not gonna go too much detail on that um, so it needs to be you need to have a specific utility it needs to be useful, you know, it needs to be something that can be used in the real world, a real world application. Um, and that specific utility needs to be fully described and it needs to be credible. And credible is where your data come in. You know, you don't need to prove that something works. For example, uh, if you're claiming a drug for treating cancer, you know, a new drug, you just have to show that it binds a re receptor that's you know, therapeutically relevant. If you want to claim a new method of treatment, you don't have to sh even show that it works in animals. Sometimes you can just show that it has a biological effect that is known to be useful for certain diseases. So you don't have to prove that it works. It just has to be credible. A person skilled in the art needs to believe that it could work. How often does that case Sorry, what's that? How often is it that you don't need a proof of concept in vivo, but they're still invested and willing to put money into that? Oh. Okay, well that's different what I'm talking about what I'm talking about now, but I think that happens in Canada a lot. <laughs> um, maybe it shouldn't. But uh, <laughs> 
you know, for sh be, well, because, you know, proof of concept in animal models can be extremely tricky depending on the disease. And sometimes, you know, you need to go on other evidence that you have initially, and it can be very expensive too. So, I mean, people do need to ra raise money at that point. It just depends on, I think it depends on uh, the disease and the commercial opportunity and how much more evidence you have would need it, it depends on a lot of things but yeah it does that does happen but in in a patent application you don't need that and you don't need it to have a valid patent in the end so what you know what you want to put in your application are the things that give you a valid patent in the end so you don't need it to have a valid patent in the end okay so and critical this is something that often gets missed um, you have to teach how to practice your invention. So when you look at a patent application, you have to ask yourself, so 20 years from now, uh, when, m you know, when uh, this patent expires, or let's say if my, uh, for whatever reason, I don't pursue patent protection, someone can read this document and they, can, they have all of the information that they need to practice the invention. Because if you don't do that, uh, your your patent can be invalidated. It could be a, a like a weak point for your patent in the future, and that's all about this exchange between this full disclosure of your invention in exchange for this temporary market exclusivity. Um, oh, okay. So what are the sections of a patent application? So you have a title, you have an abstract, you have a field of invention, you have drawings, these are your figures with your data, you have a background section, you have a summary, um, definitions, de more detailed description, you have examples. Those are your experiments uh, where you describe the experiments that you do, did that support um, your invention. And I'm just gonna go quickly into each of these. I think this is... Okay, so starting with patent claims. So each patent claim is one sentence and they're organized as independent and dependent claims. So dependent claims narrow in, dependent claims are narrower than the independent claim. They just specify um, particular features that are uh, included in the independent claim. As I mentioned before, they need to use a specific and definite language. Uh, they're interpreted based on the prior art and the disclosure. So um, the way, you know, of course you try to be clear and concise, but it's one sentence, so you can't capture everything. The way that claim gets interpreted is based on what you said in the d disclosure, which is why you need to be very careful about what you say, you say and very clear about what you say, and also based on what's known in the art at the time. Um, and you need to make sure that your claim includes very clearly all of these, the novel, uh, all of the elements or features of the invention that make it um, novel and non-obvious. And it, those, where you have w words in your claim that relate to those features, those are the words that you have to be the most careful about. And that's why some, often, you know, those are the words that you're going to want to define, even if they're very well known in the art. You're going to want to define exactly the way you're using them in your in your patent application because you'll see that sometimes things get used really broadly terms or terms are unclear in some ways by defining it you make sure that in your claim if ever there's question about how that's interpreted you can go back to the disclosure and and very clearly show how it should be interpreted in some countries in europe um, literal support is needed that means that if any language that you use in your claim has to be taken like word for word from the specification. Um, and um, so it's the wording. So when you go, when you have examination, it's the wording of these claims basically that you're gonna be uh, negotiating. So you are gonna file a set of claims with your patent application, but as it gets examined in different countries, it's gonna evolve. Um, so this was an example I thought that we could look at um, to see, you know, some of the different elements of the claim. So you can see that, like, the first part of the claim, which is called the, the preamble. Sorry, I can't see on my screen and I can't see over there. I'm, like, driving in the dark. <laughs> 
Um, okay, so you can see that the first part of the claim, you know, method of stimulating a T cell mediated immune response, blah, blah, blah. This is just general information. You know, this is all well known at the time. This is, these are not the novel inventive features of your claim. This is what's called the preamble. It's just to situate you like what kind of invention is this? Genetically modified to express a car. Then after comprises, so comprising and consisting of, these are really critical words in claims. So comprising means including. So that would mean that your invention could include other thing, other things as well. If you use the word comprising, that means your invention is just the things that you list and that's it. So comprising um, a CD19 antigen binding domain. So that would be an inventive feature. Uh, CD3 zeta signaling domain, that's an inventive feature. So here you see it's the combination of all those things that come after comprising that um, makes the invention uh, inventive. And then that, that below is just an example of a dependent claim. Okay, so critical for you, when I worked at the Montreal Heart Institute and University of Montreal, this was something that came up all the time. And I don't know, I've probably every one of you filed a patent application, had a discussion like this with someone in the tech transfer office. So inventorship on a patent application is really important. It's a legal determination and it's not the same as authorship. And having your inventorship, having the wrong inventors on a patent application can cause big complications for um, for licensing. You know, if it could come up in a due diligence and if you've got that messed up, people might not want to license your patent application. And worst case scenario, uh, if you have a patent granted and you have a commercial product and someone wants to invalidate your patent, they could invalidate it in this way. Um, <clears throat> And inventorship is not defined by the concept, it's defined by the claims. Um, okay, so the legal, here's like a little example of the legal definition, you can read it, but what it really boils down to is the difference between um, conception and reduction to practice. So the people who conceive of the novel, non-obvious elements or element of the invention, those people are inventors. The people who reduce it to practice, the people who do the work, for example, to show that it works, those people are not inventors. Um, so this can be a little bit of a sticky situation, but like, let's say someone decides, okay, I want to test uh, CAR-T and glioblastoma, and I think that, um, you know, TCR receptor, whatever, is going to be a good therapeutic target. And then other people, you know, and then you put together your CAR-T just the way you would based on how people, you know, the, the knowledge at the time. And then other people test it and show that it works. You file a patent application. The only person who's an inventor in that scenario is the person who came up with the initial design. If someone says, okay, well, we should use this domain or that not that domain or, you know, um, like they, they have an influence on the ultimate sequence of that thing, those people are inventors too. But the people who do the work are not. And I know that that can be tricky and, um, you know, some, it, it, it can be hard to negotiate. And that's why I, like one of the best practices that I give later on is to just be really open about that and make sure that everyone understands how that works and how important it is. Um, here you have like a, just, so this gives you an idea of what the process is. So we I mentioned some of the timelines, but typically you would file a provisional application and they have, you can file a provisional application, a thing that's like a provisional application in Canada. Typically everywhere I've worked, we always file in the U.S. first, um, just because that's the first place that we would want to um, pursue protection. So you'd file a provisional application, 12, that application, you have 12 months, you can add things to that application in that 12 months, you can modify it, but anything that you add new or change dramatically might not have that initial priority date, which could be a problem if you file your provisional and you publish a paper. So you have to be careful about that. And then at 12 months, you would complete the application, probably you would file what's called a PCT application, which is a world application. And the thing, the great thing about a PCT application is that 
it gives you, it's like as if you'd filed in, I don't know, I think it's like 80 countries that have um, agreed to this um, international treaty all at the same time. You don't have to file in every single one of those countries because that would be extremely expensive. Often, if we'll, you can file a U.S. application at the same time if you want to get the examination going quickly and really see what's going to happen in the U.S. And there is an examination process with the PCT, which is great because it can help um, streamline and reduce the work that needs to be done later on when you file in all those different countries. I think for an academic or public funded researcher, you really have to keep that 30 month deadline in mind. You need to figure out by then really if what you have is commercializable and if you have a partner for that because at that point it gets very expensive. Okay, it gets very expensive and you want to have your commercial strategy set to decide what you're going to do at that phase. So I think I'm going to skip, oh I'm almost at the end. Okay, so best practices and then I want to have some time to talk. Um, okay, so you gotta, and these are my recommended suggestions for you. You think about what your foreground inventions are. So that means the inventions that are going to be supported by your uh, research in the future, especially if you're working in a collaboration. Um, and then try to envision what are the clinical useful applications of that and what does a commercial product look like? Is it feasible to develop? Is it going to be really expensive to develop? Does it need to be commercialized? Use non-disclosure agreements for any external discussions of a project where you expect to have IP. That's critical. You know, go to your technology transfer office and tell them that you want to do this. This is this is key, and it's not just about prior art. It's also about giving your ideas away to other people and having them file before you do. Um, file, you know, you can. I think like uh, the researchers that I've worked with, they get so much out of start. You know. Get it, start to follow patent disclosures and applications in their area, and it's really easy. You know, there are great tools publicly available. Patent Lens is a fantastic one. If you have Web of Science through University of Toronto, they have this Derwent Innovation Index, which is also fantastic. You can set up searches, and you'll see it's a different way of thinking about your research, and it'll help you start to see what kinds of inventions people are filing on in your area and to really understand the prior art fully, not just um, research publications. Uh, okay, I already covered that one. And new results. So when you have new results, it can be have implications either for pending applications or for new patent ap applications. So that's something that you need to keep in mind whenever you file, uh, uh, whenever you're preparing a manuscript for publication, not when the manuscript is done and ready to submit, but before that, go talk to your tech transfer office or talk to your colleagues and figure it out. And the last thing I would say is don't be afraid to get involved in this because your involvement in this is going to make those patent applications so much stronger. You know, it's very hard for someone to come in from outside and really capture and understand everything that you're doing. Your involvement will make sure that these, you know, any patent applications that stem from your work are really high value and have the potential to be licensed and to draw the kind of investment that wouldn't be needed to make sure that patients benefit from your work.